Now we'd like to welcome back to the podium uh, Kay Mock Morgan for a personal story of what's really happening in our great state. Hey, y'all. Um, they're readying the PowerPoint, and so I'll uh, give them a second to get together. Why don't we applaud the folks? that They have been working really hard back there. <laughs> Several of us have come in with PowerPoints or music or video and just kind of handed it to them and said, hey, make this work. And every time they've been able to do that. And so gratitude is one of those things we all need to be in the spirit of sharing. Um, I um, initially responded to Lynn's request to come and hang out with you this morning as a moderator. Because those of you that know Lynn, Stefan, and know her well know that it's really not optional. <laughs> um, questions don't really end with a question mark and go up at the end. It's more of a declarative <laughs> sentence. And so you kind of say, yes, absolutely, I'll do that, um, and um, gladly did so. And not long thereafter, she found uh, her colleague and friend, Janet Wright, to send an email following, asking, hey, will you also give a, a brief kind of synopsis about parenting and being a mom and, and the impact of that? And it was about three months ago to which I said, yeah, yeah sure, absolutely, and I responded to that email. And then literally about a month later, or about a month ago now, I pulled that email up to kind of see what this month was going to um, look like on my calendar. And I said, oh, shoot. <laughs> Sister Teresa's still here. Um, I said I would do that. And I, um, I thought about ways that I could frankly get out of this. Um, not because I'm, I'm afraid to speak. I do a, a lot of that work, both in my job for pay and some of the other things I do community-wide. But frankly, in all transparency, because of the topic. Um, and because of you. This is probably one of the most vulnerable moments I'll ever have in my adult life because I'm going to get an opportunity to share with you both my greatest points of pride and my greatest vulnerabilities as a mother. Uh, and frankly, it's not something I've been looking forward to. Um, but these women, who I call my friends that I don't say no to often, convinced me. When I was probably 21, working at Wichita State University and dating the most handsome of men, Mr. Derek Morgan, he asked me what I wanted my life to look like. And I drew him a picture. And I found this picture when we moved into um, our, our second home. And it doesn't, it's not as clear for you as it might be in real life. But I, I found it, and it's framed, and it's hanging on a wall in our house. And, I'm, my undergraduate degree is in chemistry, my master's degree is in public administration, and I'm working on a doctorate degree in um, educational leadership. I am not an artist. <laughs> Hence, you will see stick people. But I drew a picture of what I, I wanted to look like, and it included the house of my dreams and the, the car that I thought I wanted to drive. You'll see that there's a minivan. It was my intent that he would drive that because I'm much <laughs> much too vain to engage in minivan driving myself. Um, I wanted an Ivy Leaf swimming pool, and I wanted a tennis court, uh, and I wanted lots of love and trees, and I drew two children. And you may or may not be able to tell in this picture, but I'm the girl, and you can tell I'm a girl because I have a little triangle skirt on. <laughs> in my mind, it's got pleats. Um, and there are two male children because I knew in my heart of hearts, I wanted male children. Hashtag boy mom, right? Um, I knew I wanted that. And when, in my faith tradition, when you speak into existence those things that you want, and you pray upon those things, and you live a faithful life, God gives you what you ask for. 
and I have had the distinct pleasure with my husband of parenting two of the most awesome young men ever to walk the face of the earth. And I say that with great pride. I thank Miss Michelle Van, who, who stood earlier, because she's had the opportunity to teach both of my young men uh, in her classroom, one of which was probably a little easier than the other. Um, but I, I, I've been fortunate and I've been blessed to, to have that which I, I thought I wanted. Um, and, and I did want. But much like other things in life, when you're deciding what it's going to look like, you don't always have the entire picture of what it is you're asking for. And so when I, when I, I prayed for and asked to be a parent of young men, um, I didn't know that the high school graduation rate for black boys in the state of Kansas was 20% less than their white counterparts. When I asked to parent African-American young men, I did not know that the AP advanced placement enrollment is double the rate for white boys than it is for young black boys. I did not know that the eighth grade reading proficiency rates for black males are at 26% points less than their white counterpoints, and the reading gap is even greater for those students. I didn't know that the suspension rate for African-American men was going to be 10% point higher. I didn't know that even if my husband and I worked really hard, succeeded in college, earned better than a living wage, and actually decided to, to, to be financially prudent and grow in assets, that my children would still be more likely to live in poverty than their white counterparts. I did not know that men raised in the top 1% were equally as likely to be incarcerated as white men raised in households that meet the poverty line. I knew I wanted sons, but I did not know the life into which I was going to bear them. I did not know. I did not know that the age of six and eight or sixth grade and eighth grade, my kids would wonder who they are. I grew up in a proud history of being an African-American woman. I know exactly what that means. I was fortunate enough, two weeks ago, my, my grandfather passed away. He was 102 years old. Died and just went to sleep, right? So you live a blessed life, you get a blessed ending. I knew what it was like to be black in, in the United States of America, and as a, as a second generation Kansas, I knew what it meant to be black in Kansas. I didn't have a feel for my children's experience and what that was going to mean as African American men. I didn't know that when we moved into our home in College Hill and we were really excited about it, that at sixth grade, all of their little friends that they'd hung out with for the last five years, 10 years, would all of a sudden develop a different definition of who my children were. I didn't know that my kid was going to come home. This very picture, we bought them. Actually, we didn't buy them. We have secured for them signed jerseys from two of the NFL football players, Troy Palomalo and Larry Foote as a result of Super Bowl, I think it was 2009. And they received these um, after Peyton, who's the oldest of the two, came home in tears one day and said he wanted a LeBron James jersey just like Jack. And I said, well, you, you know, we can get you a LeBron James jersey just like Jack, but why do we want to look like Jack, right? I mean, Jack's fashion sense is a little off. <laughs> Not sure why we want to follow Jack. And then he said to me, with all the most sincere heart, and then I want yellow hair and I want it to be flat. At that point, I had to explain to Peyton that he was black and he's not ever gonna have yellow hair. And heaven help us all, it's not ever gonna be flat. It's not how hair grows from your head. But my child was saying to me that it was tougher to be in his skin than it was for the colleagues and the peers for which 
he'd hung out with, he'd grown. He also was sharing with me that while he was just one of the six on the basketball team until he became a seventh grader, now his friends recognized as they went into the middle school system that something was different about being black and that Peyton wasn't just like them. Very hard lesson, an experiential um, conversation we have to have at our household that I'm guessing that most of you not had to have. It was that very same year that Peyton's friends came over and there was kind of this, we decorate it for Christmas like most folks do, probably wailed way too much stuff crammed in corners. And one of the kids says, hey, you guys don't have any Santa Clauses in your house. To which my precocious younger child said, nope. You ever seen a black Santa Claus? And the kid said, no. He said, well, that's why we don't have one. An aha experience of if things don't reflect who you are in the greater media, you don't see yourself in those spaces. We all have to help our children come along a way where there's an identity development process, where you have to explain to them who they are and in my place, in my faith, whose they are. It's been awesome to have a grandfather for whom they can sit and say, when all else fails, you're John Monk's great-grandson. That's the stock from which you come. But it's not always easy for them to go into those spaces. There came a time where not only did I have to tell my kids who they are, I had to explain to them who others think they are. One of the most difficult occasions I ever had as a parent was the day that we removed all of the hoodies in our house. My children were, I think Peyton was 14, Cameron was 12. Cameron had come running back, for those of you that know the Wichita community, coming through the house, running through the neighborhood with Jack and, and um, Garrett and Hugh and coming from the swimming pool. Summer afternoon and he's got this hoodie on and he's running through the, the, the neighborhood and, and all is well because it's summer, there's no school, he doesn't have any shoes, I, he may have had on pants, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and I say to him that uh, I'm gonna need all of your hoodies. And he said, why? And I said, you know, I don't know that we really want to talk about it. But it was that very summer that a young man walking through his neighborhood, eating Skittles and drinking some soda, was literally killed. And when Cameron didn't understand why I needed his hoodies, I showed him this. There before the grace of God go I. There but for the grace of God goes my child running through a neighborhood where we're really the only black people who live in our neighborhood, right? Everybody, I've gone to school district meetings when we're talking about redistricting and there are dots for all the people and where they live and you're a different dot based on your race. I know where my dot is. I can see my dot. The black people who live on the corner of Del Rose and English said, baby, you can't run through this neighborhood like that anymore because your mother's afraid for your very life. A 10-year-old doesn't get that. A 12-year-old doesn't get that. But we got rid of every hoodie in our house. I counted them, it was about $500 worth, lots of different sizes. We wore button downs and sweaters. They were like, can we not have a basketball jersey? No, you cannot wear a basketball jersey. You can, because who other people think you are is the, those lists of statistics that I read to you, that's oftentimes who people see when my sons enter the room. Yep. I didn't know that when I asked to have sons. I didn't know that when I gave birth, but I know that now. And the painfulest, the most painful part of being a parent is having to show your children that that's who people think they are. And in spite of they have to be successful. Over the last two years, 17 young African-American men 
have been gunned down. Some might argue for good reason. I don't know that there's ever a good reason to have to kill someone unless you absolutely, you know, I don't know. In two years, this is what my young men see. Both of my children, Cameron called me his senior year in high school. Um, and these are conversations we have to have at our home, right? We actually practice what happens if the police pull you over. We have to have that conversation. What do you do? What do you say? Who do you call? What do you do when this happens? And not many people have to have those conversations. But this is what happens. While a lot of people, no matter what your political persuasion, hashtag love the police, but the police kill black boys. Not a reality that a lot of folks have to deal with, but certainly one that I've had to have conversation. The first time my children were contacted by police, Peyton was on his way to prom. And his dad let him drive his brand new Lexus and with his date. And I pulled him over and I had a conversation and I said, you got to be safe. Check with her parents when you ring the doorbell, say hello to her dad, shake his hand. And my grandfather's sitting in the back of the room and he says, who are you taking? Peyton tells him the young lady that he's escorting to the prom with great pride. And my grandfather said, is she white? To which Peyton said, yes. My grandfather excused me from the room and had a separate conversation with my son. Now do know, my grandfather was married to my grandmother, who's not my bio grandmother, but the grandmother that I grew up with, who also happened to have been white. So my son is pulled aside by my grandfather and said, listen to me. Now I can only tell you the version of what Peyton repeated because they had some private words. Safety and security of her, her safety and security is sacrosanct. But if you gotta run, run. And at that point, my grandfather recounted how he actually moved to Wichita, Kansas. Because his older brother had gotten in a fight in Haynesville, Louisiana in 1932 at the general store. And he actually hit a white man. To which my grandfather's mother said, take your brother as far as you can go. Peyton came back to me and was like, Mom, do I have to go to prom? <laughs> I was like, well, we've paid for it, yes. <laughs> You're going to prom. And sure enough, about 1.30, my phone rings. And I'm sitting there like most mothers are when your kid is 17 and he's out after midnight and I'm watching, you know, the, watching the dots find my friend. And my kid calls, and I, I know it's his number, but I don't hear a voice. He literally has called the phone as he's been taught and laid the phone down because he's been pulled over by the police. And I, I hear the occasion and of course I'm, my, I'm frightened. I wake my husband and I say, at this point I need you to go find this car. Here's his dot, go see where he is. And everything went okay. He certainly showed up a little later than curfew and his response was, I don't know what I did. Why did I get pulled over? And we explained to him that oftentimes nothing. His, the question the police officer asked him was, what are you doing in this neighborhood at this hour? And his response was, I'm trying to go home. Well, you can't possibly live here. He's like, do you know my mom? <laughs> That's exactly where I live. Well, whose car do you have? My father's car. Well, show me proof of insurance. And I'm listening to this conversation thinking, please, Lord, just hand him the piece of paper. Don't think, don't talk, don't ask, just do what he's asked you to do. It lasted about five minutes and Peyton made his way home. We had a family conversation that following Sunday to talk about, okay, these things might happen. 
Again, let's go over what are the notes, who do you call, what do you do? We really thought it was kind of over. Every family's gonna get one of those incidents, right? Well, fast forward almost a year, and the phone rings with my second son, who's coming home from high school. It's five o'clock, track practice ought to be over. He ought to be here soon. And yet again, I hear the phone ring, I pick it up, and there's no talking. Cameron, are you there? Cameron, are you there? And I can hear an exchange between he and someone else. And sure enough, he's been pulled over. I wait till the call is over, and then the phone disconnects. So I can't hear any more of the conversation. I wait about five minutes, and I call, and my kid is bawling. And he said, Mom, I peed on myself. I said, it's okay. Come on. I'll meet you there. I asked him, I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I was driving, and I thought I could make it, and I hurried up, and I turned the corner, and I turned right in front of the police officer. I said, well, that wasn't very safe driving. And he said, no, it was really stupid. I said, well, was he rude? He said, no. He was really nice. I said, well, did you get a ticket? He said, no. He was really nice. I said, so what did he say? He said, well, he explained to me why it was against the law and, and how I shouldn't do these types of things, and he gave me a warning, and you know, he said, good luck on your track meet, and we talked about running track. He said he was really nice to me, and I said, well, that's good, so why the upset? He said, because I thought he was gonna kill me. I thought he was gonna kill me. In the United States of America, in 2018, that a 17-year-old child has an experience that borderline copies the one that his 100-year-old grandfather had <laughs> is beyond me. It's beyond me. It's absolutely beyond me. I think I'm going the wrong way. These are my children now. They're not so scary, although they're really big. <laughs> and in my humble opinion, parenting them along with my husband has been my greatest joy. But it has also given me an opportunity to see a side of our communities that many of you, fortunately or unfortunately, will never have an opportunity to see and will never be exposed to. When my children show up, they show up in spite of some of the created barriers, not because they haven't had educational access, both of their parents are college educated, not because they're impoverished, because we work really hard to make sure that they won't be not because they don't have family support systems that love them because they're more loved than anything in the world, not because they don't have adequate role models, they have grandparents and parents and uncles and cousins who love them. My children's barriers come as a result of the fact that they are male and they are African American in a country that was not created to love them. It just wasn't. And explaining that to them is one of the most poignant things that as a parent, I have the responsibility of doing. On a frequent basis, I am a chief administrator at an institution of higher education and I have to tell my kids, you're in college, but college was not created for you. This has been retrofit. So when it doesn't work for you, know that that's okay. Break it down, rebuild it. We don't like the ship build another one. Understand that ultimately this is your charge. It doesn't get, it's not fair. It doesn't get better. In some cases there are wins, but sometimes you're going to lose. This is your reality. Parenting young men, particularly young men of African American descent, in many cases, is not unlike parenting any other child. It's a process. You get little ones and you teach them the lessons they can handle at that point. They get a little older, you teach them what they can handle there. 
Every year, there's a different set of lessons that they have to learn. What I'd ask and what I remind my children of and what I'd ask, my ask of you, there's a set of statistics that will always come before your interaction. What we've been taught, what it is that we think we know, how we engage with the world. I remind them that yes, all of those former things are true. But 48% of African American men above the age of 25 have a college degree. I remind them that 82% of African American men do have high school diplomas. I remind them that 67 to 80%, depending on which year you pull, of African American men are actively engaged in the labor force. Only 42% of men, or 42% of those men, are holding wh white collar jobs. While the number of African American men in prison is higher than any other group, it's 6%. That means 94% of black men aren't in prison, haven't been in prison, haven't engaged in the system. So the narrative that, 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 de that creates the photo of who these people are, are the narratives that we create. It's a story that sells. And oftentimes, it's the story that keeps us in our place. It's a story that creates the fear that we won't engage in areas where we haven't engaged before, where we won't look for unusual voices, where we won't go into spaces where we're not, where we might be singular or less. I have to remind my children every day that you're a king. I created you to inherit the earth. That you were born with great, God's got great plans for you. Despite the number of people who may decide that you don't deserve that. It ain't up to them. It ain't up to them. My children are my greatest joy. The one thing, the two things that when people, when I die, I want people to look back and say, wow, look at those boys. Haven't they grown up into fine young men? Haven't they lived out the principles that their great-grandfather gave them? Not a list of statistics, not a vision of who people think they might be, but every day my charge is to remind them of who they are on the inside and how they present themselves to the world is absolutely beautiful. My challenge to you, when you see this statistic, look at the other side of the percentage. Do some reverse ordering of the information that's fed to us as a community. And remember that just like John asked you to vision those children that you loved, just like he asked you to, to, to take in and love on those kids that are most important to you, these kids have somebody who's looking for them, whose eyes are closed, who's promising and praying for their prosper and not for their harm. And I ask you to join me in that village of loving every kid that way. Thank you so much for your time. Wow, what a story. Well, as our superheroes are leaving the stage, let's give them one big last round of applause. <laughs>